the description of the night. But before we do a couple of um, little background things, when Chaucer starts the Canterbury Tales, he's already written several other works prior to this. This is the last thing he's going to um, write, and he begins writing it sometime around 1385. Right? And as I said the other day, it may or may not be finished. I'll talk a little bit um, about that as we go on. But when he writes it, he has a model in mind. That is, he's imitating another writer, okay? the Italian writer Boccaccio, who had previously written a book called The Decameron. Decameron means a hundred. It's a hundred tales, all right? And the basic premise behind the Decameron is plague has hit Italy, and so you have a group of aristocrats who flee the town that they live in and go off to a villa off in the country. Because obviously they're getting away from concentrated populations. They go off to this villa and they while away their time by telling tales. Okay? And they tell a hundred tales. So when Chaucer comes up with the idea that he's going to have his 30 pilgrims each tell four tales, essentially he's saying, I'm going to outdo Decameron, or I'm going to outdo Boccaccio, all right? <laughs> and he, he borrowed a lot from Boccaccio in other works um, as well. For example, in Troilus and Crusader, he borrowed some material from Boccaccio. Boccaccio wrote a hundred tales. Chaucer, if I remember right, um, we finished up with, I think it's 24. So he doesn't even get one-fourth of what he had originally intended, okay? Originally intended. Now, the reason I say <coughs> originally intended is my Chaucer professor, when I was a doctoral student, was a guy named... Charlie Mormon. Charles. Right? He <clears throat> His professor was George Lyman Kittredge, who is usually often regarded as the greatest scholar, the greatest Chaucer scholar who ever lived. Right? Um, Charlie was kind of in the, if you, have, if you have a rank of three at the top, Charlie would have been like, you know, 3B, 3C, 3D just below that top rank in terms of Chaucer scholars. You can find articles by him all over, a uh, couple of little books he'd written about Chaucer. Mormon argued that Canterbury Tales was complete. That it's not an unfinished work. Okay? And here's his basis for doing so. At the beginning of the tale, we will see at, at the... Um, very end of the prologue is when the host, whose name is Harry Bailey, by the way, the host says, okay, here's what we're going to do. You'll tell two tales going, two tales coming. I'll decide which one is best, and everybody else will pick up the tab for the person who tells the best tale. Everybody agrees. Okay, So that's the idea at the outset. But lo and behold, if you had the entire Canterbury Tales in front of you. What we see is that as they progress, it appears that the agreement gets modified. Because about, I don't know what it is, half, three-fourths of the way through, the host makes a comment about, you know, now that we are halfway there, which can be taken to mean distance-wise on the way to Canterbury, or it can be taken to mean we've told half our tales. Well, they're not even close to 60 tales. All right? And then at the end, before the Parsons tale, I think it is, he says we have but one more to go. 
So what Mormon and a few others, not many, this is not a widely accepted idea. It's not general consensus, in other words. What Mormon believed is that by the time Chaucer really got writing these, and he worked on it, started 1385, he died 1399, 14 years, okay, <coughs> is that Chaucer realized there is no way on God's green earth I'm going to get 120 stories out of this. In fact, he realized I'm not going to out Boccaccio Boccaccio. Okay? And so what he does is he modifies the intention as he goes along so that when he gets to the Parson's Tale, he essentially tells his audience, hang with me for one more. I've got one more tale left, and that's it. Because the way the Canterbury Tales ends is it ends with a retraction. It ends with a little piece um, saying, you know, essentially now I've done, I've told my tale. Now, you know, gentle reader, forgive me if I've done anything that's offended you, if I've said anything that's offended you, if I've said anything that's led you into sin, and, you know, pray for my soul. Okay? But again, most people take Canterbury Tales to be fragmentary. And there's a couple of other reasons for that. One, because of how it survives in terms of manuscript form. There are a huge number of manuscripts. There are over 85 manuscripts that survive of the Canterbury Tales. And in those manuscripts, the tales survive in differing orders. There is a group of tales that usually all comes together. It's called the marriage group. Okay? And there are some other tales that kind of seem to go together. That is, they get passed along apparently in groups of two or three. But then there are these large groups or large sets of tales that seemingly don't have a common order. The knight's tale begins all of them. Okay, and generally the parson's tale ends all of them. But how Chaucer intended the rest of the tales to be understood in terms of order, <coughs> nobody is 100% positive. Okay? Now one other thing. Um, as we start to talk about the knight, I'm going to make a comment about this in a moment. Look at the description of the knight. First of all, why does he begin with a knight? Exactly. He's the highest ranking in the company. Okay. So notice what he says just before the night. Beginning uh, about line 37, 38. Chaucer says, Now before I begin my tale, while I still have some time, I'm going to tell you the condition of each of them, as it seemed to me. And also, which they were, and of what degree, and in what array they were in. Okay. He's going to tell us their condition, how they appeared. Okay. He's going to tell us which they were, that is, who they each were. What else? What degree, what level of society they were in. Okay. And how they were dressed. Now, Back up again a few lines to line 25. He says, while he was sitting at the tavern, a company came in of sundry folk. Okay. One of Mormon's um, colleagues, a guy named R.M. Lunyansky, wrote a book titled Of Sundry Folk, which is all about the pilgrims in Chaucer's Canterbury Tale. And it's largely about this three estates idea. Sundry, that is the whole gamut of society that we get depicted in the Canterbury Tales. Who's the lowest member of the company, if you read the general prologue? The lowest member of society. No, not the miller. Because the miller can make money. The miller's a crook, too. It's the parson's brother, the plowman. What does he do? He digs ditches for a living. 
Okay? He's also one of the two most honest in the entire company. Okay? One thing you're going to see as Chaucer goes through the general prologue is he fits the tale to the teller. This is something often shows up on graduate exams in, in Middle English. How does Chaucer fit the tale to the teller? Okay. Here's how. You have to look at the description of each of the pilgrims very, very carefully. And then when you get to that pilgrim's tale, you listen to what the speaker says or the narrator says in the introduction to the tale, in the prologue, and then the tale itself. Okay? Because what Chaucer does in the general prologue, this part that we're reading now, is he tells us about each of the individuals. He tells us about what things are important to them, what motivates them, what causes them distress, what causes them pleasure and joy, etc. Then when you get to the actual tale that that individual tells, you see that the kind of story they tell flows out of the kind of person they are. Right? For example, the knight we are told, is a chivalric person. He celebrates chivalry. He believes in truth, honor, justice, the American way, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then what kind of tale does he tell? He tells a romance tale. He tells a tale of love. The love of two men for a single woman. And now she essentially has to decide, and they have to fight it out, you know, for her. So it's this great kind of story that would fit his character entirely. Okay. Then the miller interrupts and tells his tale. The miller turns the knight's tale upside down. Yes, you stu still do have two men in love with a woman. A, a woman? <laughs> a woman. Vying for the love of a woman, let's say. And what he does is he takes the knight's tale and he just pokes fun at it. Why? <laughs> because the miller is in the night. The miller is lower on the social stratus. And so what he's doing is he's making fun of all these ideals that the aristocrats hold. And he's saying, essentially, that whole courtly love tradition, you know, some knight trying to woo his lord's wife, etc. Well, it's just nothing but good old down and dirty adultery in the street that I live on, and so what does he do? He tells a story about dirty, raunchy adultery. Okay. So Chaucer does this with each of the characters. He picks out what is really important about that character, and then he accentuates that in the tale they tell. There are only two characters, however, only two pilgrims, the Chaucer presents entirely in positive terms. Entirely. There's no undercutting of their character at all. Okay? The parson and his brother the plowman. Everybody else. Chaucer the writer, not Chaucer the persona in the poem. Chaucer the writer gets a little dig in at the pilgrim's characters. Why? Because he sees that they all have problems. I don't mean, you know, psychological, personal issues. I mean, they're all sin, um, sinful and fallen. They all put on a, a false air. Okay? And what Chaucer is attempting to do is he's trying to pull the curtain back and show us the real individuals. Okay? So, look at the night. A knight there was and a worthy man that from the time that he first began to ride and out, he loved chivalry. Meaning, from the time he first began to ride a horse, he loved chivalry. What that means is he likes the idea of chivalry. He loves the idea of being the knight in shining armor, rescuing 
the damsel in distress. Okay? But what else does he love? It's not only chivalry. It's truth and honor, freedom and courtesy. See, that's why I said, you know, in the American way, kind of. He's Captain America on horseback. Full worthy was he in his Lord's wars. And thereto had he ridden no man farther, as well in Christendom as in heathenness. In other words, he has been out fighting in the Lord's wars, meaning his personal Lord's wars, the king's wars, and he's ridden farther out in battle than any other man. And we're told he's ridden farther out in Christendom as well as in heathen lands. Okay? And then we get a big, long list of the kinds of battles that he fought in. He fought in Alexandria, for example. Okay? And you're going to get, you know, um, a bunch of names. He fought in Prussia, he fought in Russia, etc. He fought in Grenada, he fought in Al Jazeera. Turn over to the next page. And you've got this big, long footnote telling you where all these places are. Okay? <coughs> Notice what comes at the end of that long footnote. The places not identified with a specific date of battle saw protracted hostilities between Christians and non-Christians during the period in question. Okay? The Great Seas, the Mediterranean, etc. Here's the problem. Many of the places that Chaucer describes as the knight having fought at are not battles between Christian and non-Christian. The battles between Western Christian, Catholic Christian, and Eastern Orthodox Christians. In other words, they're battles between Christians. And because not all of the Crusades were battles against Muslims. Some of the Crusades, especially the later Crusades, were battles where Western Catholic Christians were raiding Eastern Orthodox lands for their riches. Christian against Christian. Not supposed to do that. All right? And so we get at the end of all of that, Line 70, he never yet, no villainy, never said. What does Chaucer give us in that one line? He never yet, no villainy, never said. Never, no, never. Triple negative. And yet, what do grade school teachers teach their elementary charges? A double negative is a major no-no. Wrong. Chaucer, not in Canterbury Tales, I think it might be Troilus and Crescent, actually has a line where he has a quadruple negative. Four negatives. Does that mean they all cancel each other out? No. What's he mean? He's, he's emphasizing, this guy really never said anything bad. Okay? In all his life, unto any manner of person, he was a very, that is true, Perfect, gentle, meaning noble knight. Okay. Gentle. You'll see it spelled a variety of ways. <coughs> I sure hope you're going to get rid of this crazy thing for the last two weeks. It just doesn't let go. And what it means, your gloss tells you there is noble, okay? It's not only noble, it's also good-mannered, courteous, well-behaved, how about virtuous, okay? This is going to be important for when you get to the wife of Bastion. Because Chaucer's going to say an awful lot about virtue and virtuous behavior and how virtue doesn't come from blood. Virtue doesn't come from heredity or 
Nobility doesn't come from heredity. This is one of the things I love about The Knight's Tale. The film that Heath Ledger. Because what they show in that film is his nobility, which has nothing to do with patents of nobility, meaning your birth certificate. It's all how you behave. All right? Now, this. Anybody know who Terry Jones is? Do you know? Yeah, founding member of the Monty Python troupe. Okay. who is also a medieval scholar. Terry Jones wrote a book in the, I think about 77, titled Chaucer's Knight. Because prior to Jones doing this, nobody had done this. I don't mean written a book about Chaucer's Knight. He researched each and every one of the battles that Chaucer's Knight is described as having fought in. And what he comes away with is on the basis of the battles that Chaucer says the knight fought in, this guy's not such a great person. Okay? Because many of the battles that he fought at, as I said, were battles against other Christians. And they were battles not for God and country, they were battles for filthy lucre. Merely for spoils of war. And so what Jones did was he says, you know, look, Chaucer on a surface level seems to be elevating the knight, seems to be saying, what a great and wonderful model of chivalric virtue. But then he goes through and lists all the battles. And part of Jones' thesis is Chaucer's audience would have understood what those battles meant. Okay? It would be like our writing a novel about, you know, say, Vietnam and the Gulf War, etc., and saying, you know, he was there at My Lai, the My Lai Massacre. You know? Or he was there at Abu Ghraib. Not a great thing to have on one's CV, etc. Okay? So then Chaucer goes to talk about the knight's son, who is his squire, okay? and he has a yeoman, and what do we find out about the squire? He's got long curly hair. He likes to sing. He can write poetry. He can dance. Okay? In other words, he is going to be a model knight. Because knights were supposed to be able to write poetry, sing, dance, probably play cards, you know, whatever else. Okay? Then he describes the yeoman. Dressed all in green. Why? Because he's a forester. It's his job to go do the hunting for the squire to cook the meat for his father the knight. And remember, in the model that you have, you have the knight, squire, page. Okay? A young boy, generally about the age of seven, could get taken in by a knight as his page. He's going to start off doing things like cleaning up the horse stall. And that's pretty much it. Maybe rubbing down the horse if he's lucky. The squire takes care of the knight's personal needs as well as the knight's war gear. Weapons, armor, horse, making sure the horse is well fed, brushed, clean, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and each of these is an apprenticeship period. That's how we have our modern day apprenticeship comes out of this, okay? So you have apprentice, journeyman, master, okay? Skip um, the rest of the description of the yeoman and such, and go to the nun, page 401 in the left-hand column. <coughs> she is one of the few pilgrims who's actually named. Madam Eglantine, okay, which is a flower. <clears throat> Early species of rose, we're told. Okay, there was also a nun, a prioress, that of her smiling was full, simple, 
and coy, that is modest. Her greatest oath was by Saint Loy, Saint Eligius, a seventh century bishop of Noyon in France, patron saint of both goldsmiths and blacksmiths. Now it's kind of interesting that you know her greatest oath is by Saint Loy, the patron saint of goldsmiths and blacksmiths. In other words, a metal worker. And we're going to see she's got a piece of gold that she's wearing on her chest. She was called Madame Eglantine. Full well she sang the service divine, that is the mass. Intuned in her nose full seemly. Okay, now what does that mean? Intuned or intoned in her nose full seemly. Pardon? Okay, yeah, I mean, it is a plan she sang well, but how does she sing it? Kind of nasally. So she sings like this. Think Fran Drescher, the nanny. Okay? And then imagine Fran Drescher singing for church. <clears throat> and not only that, but French, we're told, she spoke full, fair, and that word is fetishly, okay? But it gets glossed elegantly because the meaning has changed. What we consider to be a fetish is not what they would have understood that me the meaning of that word, okay? She spoke French fair and elegantly. But then notice what Chaucer does in the very next sentence. He tells us how elegantly after the school of Stratford at Bow. And what he means by that is he says in that first line, she could sing French very well. Like y'all in Woodbury. That's what Stratford at Bow means. She sang French provincially in a kind of hick dialect. She didn't sing it like the French of Paris, for French of Paris was to her unknown. In other words, good, proper, beautiful French. She would sing something like, parlez vous Francaise? Okay. You know, you don't pronounce final S's in French. Okay. What else would she do? We're told at meat or at dinner. Well taught was she withal. That is, she has good manners. She knows how to eat properly. She wouldn't let any morsel from her lips fall. Well, that's good. You know, in other words, she doesn't eat with food dropping out of her mouth. I don't know whether you call that good manners or not. Um, what else? Nor did she wet her fingers in her sauce deep. Okay, if you're familiar with eating roast beef au jus, okay, where you have the sauce, she doesn't dip her fingers, we're told what? Full deep. So how deep does she get? <laughs> I mean, see what Chaucer's doing? Okay, he says one thing that implies how wonderful, and he gets a little subtle dig in. He's like John Leno, uh, Jay Leno of the 14th century. You know, what Leno is good for in terms of his monologue is he'll make a statement and then he comes right back and gets the dig that completely takes away the positive statement before. What else? Well could she carry a morsel and well keep that no drop never fell upon her breast so she can Remove the food from the plate, bring it to her mouth without spilling it all over herself. In courtesy, she set much pleasure. Her over lip she wiped so clean that in her cup there was no farthing seen of grease. Her upper lip she would wipe so clean after eating that when she would take a glass goblet and put it to her mouth, you couldn't see a print of her lip on that goblet. Okay. And she probably drank, you know, she did the little finger thing like Petunia Dursley does. 
Certainly, we're told, what else? She was of great geniality, pleasant and amiable of disposition, and it paid counterfeit manners. So if you have to counterfeit manners, what's that mean? You don't really have them. Okay. Of court, and to be a stately of manner, and to be held what? Worthy of reverence. She wants to be held worthy of reverence. In other words, she wants people to think highly of her. She's a nun. What should nuns think of themselves? They should be humble. They shouldn't be putting on airs, which is what we've been told all throughout the description of her. She does. Okay. Okay, so Chasta says, well, let's talk about her conscience for a moment. She was so charitable and so piteous, that is, full of pity, compassionate, that she would weep if she saw a mouse caught in a trap, if it were dead or bleeding. Poor little mouse caught in a trap would break her heart. Okay? This is how compassionate she is. She has small hounds that she fed with roasted flesh or milk and wastel bread. What's wastel bread? White bread. We think of white bread in England. Well, you have to understand, in Chaucer's day, white bread is the bread that is finely made from finely ground flour. Okay? In other words, it's bread you can eat without breaking your teeth. Because the other bread, you could literally break your tooth. Because sometimes there would be little pebbles in it from the millstone that would grind the wheat. Okay? And the wheat would not be ground very fine. So she feeds her hounds roasted meat and white bread. But sore she wept if any of them were dead or if a man or men might smite it, okay, with a yardstick. Her heart, her conscience and her heart full seemly were told, her wimple she had, that is, her nun's habit, she has all tied up and everything, okay. Her mouth is small, soft and red, but she had a fair forehead, which means large. Has an abnormally large forehead. All right. What else? She wore a coral about her arm. Okay. In other words, she wears jewelry. And there too, on her breast, we're told, she hung a brooch of gold, on which there was writ a crowned A. And after, amor vincit omnia. So she has this brooch that looks like this, and it's got an A with like a crown on it. And then underneath it, amor vincit omnia. What's amor vincit omnia mean? Love conquers all. What kind of love is amor? It's romantic love. It's erotic love. This is not caritas von, uh, vincit omnia. Caritas is divine love. Love for your fellow man. This is, let's go jump in the sack, love. Is this proper for a nun to be wearing? Not at all. Okay, so she's got, and keep in mind, what's this made out of? Gold. Nuns are just like monks. Different sex. But they take, depending upon the order they're in, they take the same vows. What are at least two of those vows? Poverty, chastity. Okay. Usually another one is silence. Doesn't mean complete silence. Right? Say that again? 
No, she's not taking up with the monk, as far as we know. <laughs> okay? So, she's compassionate. She feels if a little mouse gets caught in a trap. She feeds her dogs roasted flesh and white bread, and she has jewelry, and she wants to be thought highly of. What has Chaucer just shown us about this nun? She's not very nunly, or she's not a good nun. Okay. Another nun was with her, and they have a chaplain that is a priest with them. And then Chaucer gives us the monk. Okay. So notice, we began with the knight, <coughs> and then we had a couple other people kind of of his class, the squire, the yeoman. Okay. Then he gives us the nun. Okay. This is one of the estates. This is the aristocratic estate. The nun is part of the church. And then we're going to get the monk and the friar and later on the sumner and the partner. So a monk there was. An outrider that loved venery. And your gloss tells you. An outrider was a monk whose job was to leave the cloister to take care of his monastery's business in the world at large. One of the common accusations made against monks was that they loved the secular world more than the cloister. In other words, they wanted to be involved with real people. Okay? But it says also that he loved venery. And your gloss tells you venery just means hunting. Well, venery does mean hunting. It also suggests, however, something else. Look at the root of that word. V-E-N-E. -E. Can you think of another word that begins with V-E-N-E? -E? Yeah, maybe add real on the end. Venereal. Okay. So when it says he loves venery, it's not only hunting deer. <laughs> it's also hunting deer in deer's other suggested meaning. Okay? An outrider that loved venery. A manly man. In other words, this guy is a man's man. A man would look at him and go, yeah, you know, he's one of us. You know. To be an abbot able. That is to be a good abbot. Full many a dainty horse had he in his stable. And when he rode, men could hear his bridle from a good distance away. Why? Because his bridles have bells on them. Okay, he's a monk. And he has not one horse, not two, not even three. He has many horses. Okay. What else? We're told the rule of St. Mar or St. Benedict, and we get, you know, um, descriptions of the monks of St. Benedict and uh, St. Morris, okay? St. Benedict is the founder of Western monasticism. St. Benedict was the one who came up with what's called the rule of St. Benedict, which is a pretty long list of behaviors that monks ought to follow. I can tell you right now what some of those behaviors are not. Hunting, venery, okay, having multiple horses, being fat, having nice clothing. Okay. Pretty much the rule of St. Benedict is this. You work and pray. And work means you work in the monastery. Tending the garden, baking bread, Brewing beer, you know, you gotta love those Trappist monks for their beer brewing. What else? We're told that this same monk let old things pass. What old things? The rule of St. Benedict. And he held after the New World's course. It doesn't mean New World America. He means this guy's a thoroughly modern monk. Modern 1385. <laughs> so what does that mean? He doesn't, 
He doesn't hold with those 6th century notions of St. Benedict. He likes to be involved in the world. For example, he gave not of that text a polled hint, that is a plucked hint, that said that hunters cannot be holy men. No, 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 no. Nor that a hunk, uh, hunk, monk, a hunky <laughs> monk, if you want, nor that a hunky monk is wretchless or reckless, like a fish that is waterless. That is, a monk out of the cloister is like a fish out of water. He says, no, 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 no. And notice Chaucer says, the poet, and I said, I like that opinion. He's right. Monks shouldn't be cloistered up in their cells. What should he study and make himself wood that is mad, crazy? Upon a book and cloister, always to pour or to work with his hands in labor, as St. Augustine bent that is requested. Why should a monk only work in the monastery? No, no, no. What good does that do to the world? Okay. What is the purpose of a monk in the monastery? Okay, to keep separate from the world, what else? What, what is the monk supposed to do? Okay, they copied books. That was part of their work. What else? They prayed. Their prayers weren't just for themselves. Their prayers were for the world. Now, if one accepts the validity of prayer, then you would have to say, well, that's for the world. That is a good thing for the world. Chaucer's monk says, what good does it do the world to have monks off in their monasteries? No, no, no. Let St. Augustine have his own work to him reserved. Let us go find our own work. Okay. Therefore, that is, because he didn't hold to the old ideas, therefore he was a precursor all right. That is, a hard writer. When he got on his horse and went out hunting, he really hunted. Greyhounds he had for hunting and riding, because hunting and riding we're told, was all his lust. That is all his desire. No cost would he spare. And then Chaucer describes, as he told us he was going to, what he's wearing. And what's he wearing? His sleeves have at the cuff, okay, grease, that is gray fur, expensive gray fur. He's not dressed in wool. This isn't Friar Tuck, in other words. This guy, you know, if he's in London and shops, he shops at Harrods. He goes expensive, or Burberry, if you want, you know. Two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, one of the times when my family and I were in London, my daughter, my eldest daughter, wanted to go in Burberry just to, you know, look around. And, you know, we walked in, looked around, walked out. Because, I mean, you touch anything, and, you know, it's more than I'm worth. Even like a purse, I mean, $400 for a little piece of leather. Go figure. <laughs> so what, is, what else are we told? Okay. Fastened under his chin, he has a gold pin rot. A love knot. A love knot. What's a love knot? A symbol of. First word, thank you. Love. Okay? <laughs> it's a symbol of love. It's very similar to this. Not in its appearance. It's, it's not a love knot with an A and all that kind of stuff. But it has the same symbolic power. Meaning, what motivates this guy? Eros. Okay. His head's bald, shone as glass, I mean really bald. His face looked like it had been anointed. Yeah, kind of 
oily and greasy. Okay? If you're familiar with A Knight's Tale, which one is it? Think of the fat guy, it's either the partner or the summer, I can't remember which one, that harasses Chaucer. Okay? Eyes kind of bugging out, fat face, and he looks all sweaty. That's a pretty good description of the friar. He was a lord full fat and in good point, okay? good condition. His eyes were bright and rolling in his head. I don't know if that means he's like Marty Feldman. They go, you know, every which way. What else? That steamed as of a furnace of lead. His boots were supple. His horse was in green estate. Okay, his boots were supple. That is, this was worn leather. I don't mean worn, that he had them for 20 years. I mean worn in the manufacture. The leather has been beaten, so it's very nice and supple, and it moves with the contour of the foot and ankle. It's expensive. These are like nice Italian <coughs> shoes. Right? And we're told certainly he was a fair prelate. A fat swan loved he best of any roast. Anybody know how big a swan is? Like twice the size of a turkey. Okay? His palfrey was brown as a berry. So we've now had descriptions of two members of the church. How are they described? Sorry, that was a mark. How are they keeping to their vows? Yeah, they're kind of hypocritical. So now we're going to get another one. A friar. A friar there was a wanton and a merry. Wanton, your gloss tells you pleasure seeking. If you describe a person today as wanton, what does it mean? Loose. Sexually licentious. Okay. He was a limiter. And your gloss tells you a friar licensed to preach, minister, and hear confessions in a specified limited area, like Rutherford County, or the city of Murfreesboro. Okay? And he was a distinguished man. In all the orders for, okay, there are four monastic orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, Carmelites, and the Augustinians. In all the orders for is none that knows as much of dalliance and fair language. Dalliance. Your gloss tells you flirting. Well, it can go a little bit more than flirting if you pay attention to the following lines. He had made full many a marriage of young women at his own cost. Right? In other words, he got many young women married off, and he paid for the weddings. Now, why would he do that? Okay. He got, impreg got them pregnant, possibly. See, I think maybe I'm the only person in the world who reads the next line this way, and probably just because of my own dirty mind or something. Unto his order he was a noble post. What do you think that noble post means? Coming as it does right after the previous line that he was responsible for many women getting married. I don't think it just means he was an underpinning founding member of his order. I think he was a noble post with a lot of the women in town. Okay? As we will find out later on. Or at least it is highly suggested. Well beloved and familiar was he with Franklin's overall in the country, okay, and with worthy women of the town. Why with worthy women of the town? For he had power of confession. That is, 
they could come to him, he would hear their confession, and he had the power of absolution. He could absolve them of their sins. As he said himself, more than a curate. That is, he had more power of confession than the local parish priest. For of his order he was licentiate. Yes, literal surface meaning. He was licensed. But what else does licentiate sound like? And it would have sounded like it in Chaucer's day as well. Licentious. Which means without law. Or broke the law. Okay? For he was licensed full sweetly. Heard he confession. And pleasant was his absolution. He was an easy man to give penance. That is, he gave an easy penance to those whose confessions he heard. To the Franklins he says one thing. And to the women he says something else. Thereas he wished to have a good pittance, that is, donation. He knew how to give penance because he knew what kind of donation he wanted. Oh, you've just confessed your sins. Here's your penance. Slip me a 20. 20 pounds will do it. Okay. And they give 20 pounds. They go away scot-free. They're cleansed of their sins. They have their penance. For unto a poor order for to give is sign that a man is well eschewed. In other words, if you give a donation to one of the four poor orders, it shows you are really confessed and contrite of your sins. You're really honest. But, for if he gave, he does make assert that he knows that a man was repentant. That is, if someone pulls out his wallet and hands him a check or hands him money, this monk or friar says, oh, well, I'm convinced that you are sincere. For many a man so hard is, so hard is of his heart that he may not weep, although his sorrow hurts him. So, he's so hard of heart that he can't weep. He can't weep tears of contrition like Psalm 51 says to do. So what can he do instead? Here, let me write you a check, Father. Buying, in other words, salvation. Therefore, instead of weeping in prayers, men give silver to the poor friars. Which is harder? To really feel contrition? To really feel Sorry for the sins one has committed, or to simply give somebody a check, or to give money. Okay. His tippet, that is his bag, was stuffed full of knives and pins to give to young wives. Certainly he had a merry note, that is, singing voice. Well could he sing and play on a lyre. Of Yettings and his songs, he bear entirely the prize. In other words, he can really sing well. His neck was white as the fleur de lis. He was strong as a champion. He knew the taverns well in all the tester. Okay. So he knows well all the inns of town. I bet he does. <laughs> and he knows well all the barmaids in town. And he thinks. He knows them better than a lazar, a leper, or a beggar. For unto such a worthy man is he, accorded not as by his faculty, to have with sick, or such, is what it means, not only sick, even though your gloss is sick, Lazarus' acquaintance. Okay, notice what he's just said. This friar doesn't think it is good policy to hold with, to be seen with, the sick lepers or the sick beggars. No, it's not honesty. <coughs> it, what, may not 
the advance. Where's the good in it for me? What am I going to get from a leper? Lepers don't have money. Right? It may not advance for to deal with such poral, such poor folk. But with rich and sellers of vittles, vital, okay, and overall there as profit should arise. So what motivates them? Not, you know, Christ's parable of the last judgment in Matthew 25. Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. No, he says, screw the least of these. I want to hang around with the powerful. Okay? Courteous he was, lowly of service, that is, humble of service. He was the best beggar in his house. This guy really put on the charm. He knew how to get money from people. For though a widow had not a shoe, so pleasant was his in principio, meaning the beginning of his homily or sermon, so good was he that by the time he went, he would have a farthing from her, even though she didn't even have shoes. So it's not only the rich he takes from. He takes from the poor as well. Yes, they willingly give it. Right? His purchase or income was better than his rent. We're told, that is, his expenses. And he could convert, we're told, as were it right of wealth. In love days, there he could offer much help. For there was not a like cloisterer, that is a monk, with a threadbare cope as is a poor scholar. But he, that is this friar, was like a master or a pope. How does the pope usually look? Don't think of the current new pope, Pope Francis, because I think he's going to be a little bit different. You know, they're usually dressed all this finer and everything. One of the things Francis immediately did, you know, rather than put on the full papal regalia and everything, he just went out in the simple white with a skull cap. He didn't go off with the big mitre and all that kind of stuff. What's being said here? This guy wants to be seen as powerful, as influential. We're told of double worsted wool was his semi coat, that is his cloak. Okay? Rounded as a bell out of the press. The cloak looks like this. It's got a very wide hem down at the bottom. What else? He lisped for his wantonness to make his English sweet upon the tongue. And in his harping wind that he sang, his eyes twinkled in his head aright, as do the stars in the frosty night. His name was Hubert. So the nun is Madame Eglantine. <coughs> the friar is Hubert. So now we've had three members of the church. None of them is really positive. Okay. In terms of the description of them. And then we get a merchant, merchant, which we're going to skip. Go on very briefly to the clerk of Oxford. Okay. Did I skip? Did I go over? Did I skip from the friar into the monk? I don't think so. No, no friar begins at 208 or whatever, and he's named at 269. Yeah, the monk, yeah, the monk, the monk doesn't. Though Chaucer does seem to give the longest descriptions to the church. And here's one of the reasons why. In the 14th century, the church was pretty corrupt. And so you had a lot of people writing about some needed changes in the church. Chaucer is one. John Gower is another. Uh, William Langland is another. The visions of Piers Plowman and such. Okay. Go very briefly on page 404 to the clerk. The clerk is a guy studying for the ministry, studying for the clergy. All right? He's at Oxford. 
And all I want to emphasize about him is look at this the description. I mean, he is poor, he's thin, he's hungry. How does he eat better? What's he spending his money on? What do you have to spend your money on every beginning of the semester? Books. Yeah, other than tuition. Books. Okay. He has 20 books, we're told. 20 books in 1385 would be like you owning what is in Walker Library. I mean, to have a single book would be an amazing thing. Because keep in mind, they're all produced by hand. Okay? So he saves his money to buy books because he's a scholar. Okay? Um, skip from there and go to page 407. Like I said, I'm trying to get through the general prologue so that Shiloh can do Wife of Bath on Tuesday so we can have the exam on Thursday. Um, wife of Bath. You gotta love the wife of Bath. Line 445. A good wife was there of beside Bath. That is, she lives near the town of Bath. But she was a little deaf. And that was too bad. Of cloth making, we're told, she was very good. How good was she at making cloth? She rivaled the cloth makers in Flanders. Okay, in an Ypres of Ghent, we're told. What else? What kind of person is she at home? Well, in all the parish, wife was there none that to the offering before her should go. To the offering, that is, to the Mass. Doesn't mean offering plate, it means to the Mass. What does that mean? When she gets up to go take the Eucharist, you better not get in front of her. Okay? If you're a lady, she needs to be at the front. Have you known people like this? Okay. Because if they did, certainly wroth was she, and she was out of all charity, that is, all Christian love, as she's going up to take the Lord's body. She's out of all Christian love. Okay? We're told that her coverchiefs, that is her head coverings, were so well made and of so many, how much does it weigh? Ten pounds. Okay. Her hose were of scarlet red. Okay, very well tied. Her shoes were moist, that is supple and such. Her face was bold and fair and red of hue. Red of hue. Makeup? Probably not makeup. Ready. Ready complexion. Okay? She was a worthy woman all her life. Husbands at church door, she had five. She's been married five times. Now, in the medieval Catholic Church, and even in the church today, one marriage perfectly fine. Two marriages, if your husband died, Entirely acceptable. If that husband dies, you really shouldn't get married a third time. Because what that shows merely is that you cannot control your animal passions. Four marriages, there's something wrong with you. Five marriages, <laughs> it's like she sleeps with whatever, whatever moves. Okay? This, this is telling us how licentious her nature is. Okay? She lives... For sex, in other words. <coughs> you know, the priest should have had something to say about her getting married five times, but frankly, with the description of her, they probably just went, no, no, whatever you want. You know. <laughs> okay? So what else? Husband to church door, she had five. Mm. Without an other company in youth. That's not including the men she had before she got married. So she's kind of like the lady of the castle that Sir Gowan said, me teach you about love? 
You know a lot more than I'll ever know. Okay? What else? Thrice had she been to Jerusalem. Well, why would you go to Jerusalem? Pilgrimage. A pilgrimage. Okay. Every Muslim is supposed to try to make it to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. Okay. It was thought good Christians, if they could, should go on pilgrimage. Now, if they can go to Canterbury, that's great. If they can go to Jerusalem, that would be the, the big one. That'd be like going to Disney, you know, the great one, as it were. But she doesn't only go once. She goes to Jerusalem three times, but she doesn't stop there. She'd been to Rome. She'd been to Boulogne. She'd been to... Um, St. James in Gaul, okay, she'd been to Cologne, and you've got glosses telling you what each of these places are famous for in terms of um, pilgr excuse me, pilgrimages. Rome, where Peter and Paul are buried, Boulogne, where there's an image of the Virgin, Compostela in Galicia, where the relics of St. James were venerated, Cologne, where the relics of the three kings, the Magi, were kept. So what does this tell us about her? Overly pious, super spiritual, in other words. Right? And she knew much of wandering by the way. Now, you can take that on its surface level. It says she's traveled a lot, but wandering. Each of these pilgrimages isn't a wandering, because what do you do when you wander? It's aimless. There's no direction. So she wandered by the way. That kind of suggests she wandered off the way. Okay. What else? We're told that she was gap to. She's got a gap between her two front teeth. Okay? In the Middle Ages, this was symbolic. This was a sign of something about your character, which was you were horny. You were licentious. You could not control your sexual appetite. Okay? And you get the impression she goes around with a smile all the time. <laughs> She's showing everybody the gap between her teeth. Right? She rides on an ambler. She's well covered with her wimples and such. Okay, She wears a big, broad hat. We're told as broad as a buckler that is a shield. Now, shields aren't, you know, a foot and a half. Shields are two to three feet in diameter. I mean, it's like a sombrero she's wearing. <laughs> Very out of the ordinary in 14th century England. What else? She wears a mantle about her large hips, and on her feet, a pair of spurs. In fellowship, well could she laugh and carp, joke. Of remedies of love, eh, she knew perchance. For she knew of that art, the old dance. She knew the dance of love. She knows how to play the game. Now, this is one of the most honest depictions Chaucer gives us. Because he doesn't really tell us anything super positive that he undercuts. No, he kind of gives us a snapshot. This is what she's like in all her glory. In other words, with the wife of Bath, what you see is what you get. She doesn't necessarily put on airs. She doesn't try to be somebody she's not. You get in front of her in line to take communion, she's going to let you know, don't get in front of me. Okay? <coughs> After her, we get the description of the person. It's a long description. A good man was there of religion. Notice he doesn't say that about any other religious character. A good man, 
a poor parson of a town, rich he was of holy thought, and work. In other words, thoughts and deeds he was rich in. <coughs> he was also a learned man, a clerk. It's important because not all parsons were learned. That is, not all persons in Chaucer's day could read. They memorized the services. He could got Christ's gospel truly preach. His parishioners devoutly would he teach. We're told he was benign. He was diligent. He was patient in adversity. Okay. Which he proved many times. We're told he would rather give out of doubt to his parishioners of his own income rather than seek their offerings for his income. In other words, here is a man who would give of his own to them rather than expect them to give to him. What else? Line 490. He lived with little subsistence. Wide was his parish, houses far asunder, and what would he do? He would ride out in snow or storm to visit the farthest one out, even if that person the farthest way out was of no account. That is, not rich. Okay? And he would do it on his feet, with a staff. This noble example was told to his sheep he gave. This is the example. That first he wrought, and afterward he taught. In other words, perfect model of leadership. B business schools teach this. Leadership in action, not word. He modeled Christ, then he taught about Christ. Okay? For out of the gospel these words he caught, and this figure he added thereto. If gold rust, what will iron do? The priest ought to be gold. If I rust, what can I expect my parishioners to do? And if a priest be foul on whom we trust, no wonder is a lewd man to rust. And that is a common, an ignorant man to rust. And shame it is if a priest take heed. A shitten shepherd, that is a shepherd covered in shit, and a clean sheep. Notice what he's suggesting. The parishioners are clean. Okay. How bad would it be then to have a shepherd who is fouled and dirty and leads them astray? Kind of like. <laughs> okay. Well ought a priest example to give to by his cleanness, how that his sheep should live, etc. Okay? But I'm going to skip a bunch because I need to get to the end. So what else would he do? He wouldn't harp on people. He wouldn't preach fire and brimstone to get them to, you know, behave. Unless he saw people being obstinate. Then he would put the fear of God into them, we're told. But what he tried to do, line 5, 19, and 20, was to draw folk to heaven by fairness. Not, you know, the 99 and the 1% fairness. What's he mean by fairness? Love. By love. By example. Okay? But if someone was obstinate, as I said, then he'd put the fear of God in them. Line 524. A better priest I trow, that is, I believe, there nowhere none is. Okay. With him there's a plowman, his brother, that had hauled of dung many a cartload. Okay, so this is what he does. Hauls dung. A true worker, Good was he, living in peace in perfect charity. God loved he best with it all his whole heart. At all times, though he gained or smart, that is, though he was hurt or though he was suffering, he loved God in all things. And then his neighbor right as himself. 
Why does Chaucer say this about the person? What is, uh, excuse me, about the plow? What is the plowman done according to what Chaucer says? A good man comes to Christ, a rich man comes to Christ and says, What must I do to be saved? Keep all the law and the prop. Yeah, I've done all that. Okay. Exactly. He says, Go and sell all that you have and follow me. But before that, what else does he say? Actually, it's a different story. Someone comes and says, you know, Lord, what must I do to be saved? He says, fulfill all the commandments. Well, which, which is the most important? There's two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Notice what Chaucer just said. He loves God no matter what happens, and his neighbor as himself. In other words, he fulfills what Christ says. And he shows us, Chaucer shows us how he does that. If somebody needs a ditch dug, the plowman digs it. And what does he not expect in return? Payment. Payment. Okay? So, you get the person and the plowman described in glowing terms. They are the, the models of virtue to be emulated in this group of sundry folk. You would expect in the Middle Ages for this or this group to be followed. Not the lower levels. Okay. Then we get the miller described. And I Read over the description carefully of the miller. It might show up on the exam. I don't have time to go through all of it. We're told a couple of important things about him. One, he's a crook. What does he do when he weighs out the grain that he has milled? He sticks his finger on the scale to make it look like there's actually more grain than is there. So that he keeps the grain that he's kept aside. All right? What else? We're told he's big. He's got a mole on his nose and he has red bristles growing out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, red hairs, but bristles, really? Then we get on 410 and 411, the Sumner and Pardoner described. Um, and these are the last two I want to hit. The Sumner is the person responsible who calls people to um, religious court. You violated some religious law, so you have to come. Usually it means you skipped church, so you have to show up <laughs> and pay a fine. Church was mandatory in the Middle Ages, as was tithing. You had to give 10%, etc. And we get a description of the Sumner's face, which is not all that attractive. And we're told that the Sumner really isn't a very good guy. Um, and then we go on to the partner. And I'm going to have time to finish the partner. So I'll do what I can. I'll take a couple minutes away from the shadow on Tuesday. What's the partner sell? Okay, he's pardoning people. So he sells pardons, indulgences. He also sells other things, you know, kill a cat, bleach its bones, shake him up with some dirt, put him in his bag, and you know, voila, you have relics. Okay, Take an old, as he even says, take an old pillowcase and it becomes the veil of the mother of God. Okay, But he's selling indulgences. What are indulgences? Pieces of paper that remove or buy you out of a certain amount of time in purgatory. They don't get you out of hell. Indulgences only reduce the amount of time in purgatory. And you can get indulgences according to a different amounts. I mean, they're like checks. You can, or or um, when you still use, use them, uh, traveler's checks, you know. You can get them at $5, $10, $25. You can get them for five cents, ten cents, twenty cents, 
You can get them for shoplifting, stealing, armed robbery, rape, murder. All right? All depends on how much you give. Okay? This is a problem. This is a huge problem in the Middle Ages. So, we get the description of the partner. And man, he is just a really slimy guy. What do I mean by that? I mean, this guy is so good at what he does. He stands up in church because he's licensed to preach in all the churches. He stands up in church and he tells people exactly what motivates him. Radix malor, uh, cupiditas est radix malor. Cupiditas. Greed, avarice, is the root of all evil. And he says, I live to make money. And then he launches into a sermon okay, that is to get people to give up their money, and they do. Now, we're not reading it, but you ought to read the partner's tale. Because we get all this stuff about him, and then he launches into his homily, into a sermon, expecting the partners to give it, and they're like, get out of here. We already know your shtick. And we're not going to do this. All right, we'll stop there. Tuesday, Professor Carroll will be uh, talking about the wife of Beth.